Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Roberta Rosenberg, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Roberta is a marketing specialist with over 25 years as a direct response marketer. She's the director of marketing and e-commerce for American Council of Engineering Companies. She was a past guest columnist at Copyblogger, where she did landing page makeovers, which we will talk about. She's also the founder of AdoptShop.com. She teaches for marketing profs and online marketing institute. If she wasn't busy enough, she also teaches for AWAI. Roberta, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I'm really excited. To, what's that? Glad to be anywhere. Yes. I'm excited to hear about your big lessons, mistakes, what worked, what didn't work in your journey. Um, and I want to first talk about landing page makeovers. Mm-hmm. Tell me about um, one of the landing page makeovers that led to some really great results. Well, you know, I, I first want to just take a step back and tell you how I got involved with doing those. Yeah, sure. Um, I had done some uh, guest contributions at Copy Blogger, and um, Brian at one point said to me, he said, you know, I really want to get more into landing pages. Why don't you do something with that? And I really hadn't thought much about it until he asked me to do it. So um, I did my research. I said, wow, this is a wonderful and direct extension from all the direct marketing work that I've done forever. And so that's when I started to do these, these makeovers um, because uh, it was the serendipity of his request. So I did about um, over 30 of them. Yeah, I was reading through some of them, yeah. And some of the companies are no longer in business. Some are. Some took my advice. Some didn't. You know, I could. I can only give, you know, this is my best advice. Right. You know, go forth and uh, be prosperous. Um, but I think for the most part, my, my biggest successes are when I check back with, with various companies. And I do that every once in a while to see what they're doing. Are they still in business? Are they evolving their, their pages? Are they evolving their businesses? I would say, you know, a good number of them are, which gives me a lot of um, gratification to know that that one contribution that I made yeah. you know, is continuing to, to show some legs. Uh, in that regard, um, and it was because of my experience with Copy Blogger that um, I was able to ex- add yet another skill set uh, and interest to the bag that I carry around with me. It seems of uh, direct marketing techniques and technologies. So I sort of reached out to Unbounce, which is and I no commercial here, but they're, they're like my favorite landing page creators. Um, and I've done some work with them. I've contributed to some of their content materials. So it it um, it really, for me, it's been a, a wonderful expression of uh, helping small businesses, especially, sort of make their mark quickly and being able to say, here's my email. Now I can tell people what to do next uh, in a reasonable way, which uh, not everybody still gets, but I think we're, yeah. I mean, most people are getting closer to the mark. Yeah. Step one, so is follow your advice, right? So the, you know, step two. So what was something that people came back to you with that go, you know, Roberta, what you told me, this really worked well. What did you tell them that worked really well for them? Um, usually, I would tell them the biggest bang for their dollar is always going to be in their headline mm-hmm. uh, and their call to action. So a lot of times just by redoing the, those things or asking them to test headlines and calls to action, um, which could also mean, especially calls to action, make the button larger, make the button orange. Um, right. Those kinds of things did make some real differences for folks. Um, getting rid of lots of little pictures and settling on a hero picture. One, uh, what in, in the film business they call the establishing shot. One establishing shot that creates... Uh, the uh, the context for everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very big on talking about with especially with my students and with uh, private clients the idea of context that your message is not being received in a vacuum. Um, it, they are bringing their sensibility to your landing page or your promotion. They are thinking about other things. The phone is ringing. Kids are running in and out. Um, right. They don't have a lot of time. To deal with you, they didn't ask to to read your advertising, um, but you've stopped them. That's a good thing, and now they're here. 
uh, looking at something. So you want to make sure that they understand it quickly, that they get it quickly, and you then tell them what you want them to do next. Sometimes you leave people hanging, and we don't know what to do next. I'm pretty smart about these things, and sometimes I go to a landing page or a website, and I think, okay, uh, what do you want me to do? Right. And I don't know. And they don't give me a map. And there's no breadcrumb. There's no go here. There's no go there. And if it's confusing me, I know it's confusing. Most people. Prospects, customers yeah. who are going to say, I don't need this. Goodbye. Yeah. There's a lot of clutter out there. What what mistakes, what are the common mistakes people are making with their landing pages that you see? Um, I, I think there is probably a bigger picture, not just with landing pages, but, but uh, promotion in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the companies think that their prospects really want to hear all about their company. Or they all want to hear all every little knit and diddle on their products or their services. But somehow it's not connected to actual usage. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, well, here it is. Here's some stuff about it. Do you want it? We know you want it. We won't try to tell you why you want it. We won't even try to figure out why you might want it. But here it is. It's almost an arrogant stance. I see this a lot in business to business marketing where, you know, we get a lot about we've been in business for 12, 150 right. years and this is we won these awards. And, well, I don't really care. Right. They don't really care. You don't care. We care. Uh, our prospects say, how is it? What's in it for me? Right. How much? And what if I don't like it? Those are the three big questions. Landing pages. Repeat that again, because that's pretty. That's a good one. All right. What's in it for me? Yes. How much? And what if I don't like it? Yeah. No one wants to get stuck, especially when they can't touch or feel it. In the online world, we have to get as close as we can to uh, replicating the the touch and feel, the brick and mortar experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I've never seen anybody else add that third question, but for me, it's a critical. I like that. Question. Yeah, because you want you want that guarantee. If you don't like it, right? You know, what if I? So I could you know feel warm and fuzzy and sleep well even after I purchase if I need to return it. Right. So what I find is that most promotion, especially in B two B, I think they do a better job in, in business to consumer, is that they don't really do that. They don't really connect the thing to the need or the benefit uh they sort of say well they know how they're going to use it well maybe they do maybe they don't assume that somebody's brand new or even if they've been doing it 30 years remind them on how they can be doing this thing mm -hmm. um so i think landing pages promotions in general more times than not will fail because they haven't addressed these three questions right in yeah. a lead yeah. gen operation you don't have to get too far afield in you know, what if I don't like it, right? You're still trying to convince them that, you know, they've got a headache, you've got an aspirin that's going to solve it. Right. But um, for the most part, when you connect, it, don't make the, the product or, or the thing, the message. The message is your prospect. The message is connecting with them, him or her, to get something, that message understood and then engaged with. Yeah. Yeah, so people need to focus on the customer more. So who does a really good job of this? Um, I think in the um, uh, in the consumer world, I think Apple does a very good job. I think Amazon does a very good job. Um, I think uh, there a lot of business to consumer companies have gotten these facts a little bit earlier than my B2B brethren. Mm -hmm. um, in B2B, there still is the tendency to think somehow marketing and business to business is way different than marketing and business to consumer. And I just finished doing um, a 30-minute course for marketing profs just on this point, which it's really not about B2C or B2B or B2G. It really is about people to people and being able to really connect with people. Um, I see a lot of technology companies that do it well. Um, Clarity is one, uh, and I'm just for transparency's sake, I've consulted with them. I've seen it with Unbounce. I have seen it with uh, IBM is doing a much better job of connecting stories 
to um, to their products, and even even like very highly technical products. But yes, there's a there's a human component there, and I think General Electric um, has always done really good. A television advertising that connects um, a lot of heavy-duty technology to, to people and how people actually use it and benefit. Mm -hmm. So those are just just off the top of my head. Yeah, no. So Roberto, do you, when you consult with clients and you tell them this, you need to focus on the customer, you have too much about your history and you, do you get pushback or do they realize that right away that this it they need depends. to change? It, it depends. Um, sometimes they, you know, they just need me to tell them what they already know. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they will try to convince me of why they're, that, in, that information about 150 years is really important. And I'm saying, you know, when you have it, and I'll use, and I like to use the headache analogy a lot. So if you have a headache, do you really care whether Bayer Aspirin has been in business 150 years or another company has been in business for six months? You have a headache. Where do you go? Who's going to give you the best relief? Well, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they care about. Yeah. Who's going to give me the best relief? Now, once I've decided on you, then how long you've been in business becomes supportive data. It helps me feel good about making a decision. Yeah. But it's supportive data. It's not the driver. And too many companies think their information is the driver. Yeah. You can go to their website. And say I don't even know what they make here. Right, <laughs> that's true. Right, they're, and their customers that say, "Well, our customers know." I said, "But suppose I'm not a customer yet. Suppose my boss, I'm a research. My boss has said, go research.' And I come to you, and I go, but I don't even know if I'm in the right place. Yeah. Um, nobody wants to feel uh, behind the eight ball when they first get started. It's not how you begin this relationship. And that for me, marketing uh, is about a relationship, uh, initiating, it's like dating. I mean, it, to me, it's like an online romance. It's a romance. You know, you uh, want to put your best foot forward. You start slow, you find out about each other, you know, and then you could sort of move to, you know, steps along the way. This is especially so in lead generation. But um, we, we lose that connection, I think, sometimes, of uh, not understanding that uh, if I go out and meet somebody for the first time, I'm sitting there over coffee, and they say, after an hour, gee, we really like each other. Let's go get married. Uh, it's a disconnect no, you, there. Yeah. You've just said, hello, there's a disconnect. Uh, and that's what also I think a lot of companies do. They rush the sale and mm -hmm. push all this information at you. And you're like, whoa, I just wanted to have a cup of coffee. Right, right. You know, just don't rush me. Don't. And I, so I think that's another, another problem that marketing has. Yeah. Not recognizing that there's this, this relationship. It has to be nurtured. It has to be respected. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want them to come back after that first cup of coffee, yeah, then you need to, uh, to, to continue to respect and invest in that relationship. Yeah. So, Roberta, I always like to include a fun fact about the guests that maybe most people don't know. So, I have two for you. One, in your early 20s, you dabbled with stand-up comedy I as a did. career, which I'm going to ask about. But first, the other one was you've been online in the online space since 1986. Yes. What did the online space look like in 1986? What were you doing? It was, it was quite uh, – it was very different. It was uh, very hobbyist. Um, and I was not a I was not a tech person, and certainly in college or in my early years. But I was uh, working as a freelance copywriter for a small advertising agency. They had an account with General Electric, who I happen to mention before. Um, that General Electric had big mainframe computers that they were looking to monetize the downtime, nights and weekends, and they were experimenting with private online networks. This was a time of um, the well, which was coming out of San Francisco at that time, they were all starting to bubble up a little bit. These were private subscription only networks. There was no internet as we know it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was asked to be the copywriter to launch this little tiny division of General Electric called Genie, G E N I E. Um, and um, I started to write copy for them. 
uh, for this new service. And um, I quickly, when I got a modem, it was a 1200 baud modem, which was a screamer for its time. And I went online and it didn't take me long to realize that this was the future. That, what did you see? Um, what, what did I see? Yeah, that time, yeah. That, that, that this was the future. Right, yeah. Um, the ability to talk to people real time from all over the world, and we're talking a couple of hundred people. Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, Genie was set up by tracks or channels, so there were people who were playing games on one channel and people who were chatting on another channel. And it was no video, there was no visuals, it really was just texting right. on the screen for, for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, I just seem to, to realize that the ability to communicate real time in this fashion, I just said, I, and I used to tell friends, I said, I have just touched the future. This is going to change everything, the way we work, the way we play, Everything. I did meet my second husband uh, on this service as well. On what? Online, you mean? On Jamie. Oh, really? Yes. So he was one of the hundred people. He was one of the couple of hundred people who was a, a you know tech geek hobbyist. Uh, and um, when there's only a handful of women and there's a hundred, you know. So you were the first copywriter guys. online, one of the first copywriters online, and one of the I first so. online dating success stories. I, I think so, though we didn't consider it online dating. We would just chat. Right, right. And then, you know, people would uh, be, you know, start to get friendly after a while and um, have private conversations right. and marry and all those things. Um, so I guess I was the first copywriter online. I do know that uh, when I was a member of the Direct Marketing Association of Washington, I had been for a number of years. I, I think I was the first person who actually forced them to add my email address in the directory, which was like 1,200 people. And I think I was the first one to say, you have to put an email address because this is important. Um, I remember dragging clients to this technology. So it's a huge do paradigm this. shift for people because it's what huge. you got it doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of them said, oh, I don't know. And I said, you you got to go with me here. Rarely did what my clients drag me. I was always, I, I can probably still need to, I drag them with me. Yeah. Come on, this is brand new. We got to be doing this. Um, but I do remember thinking that this was going to just change everything. Yeah. Uh, everything that we had known, everything that we were going to do. And, you know, I I, I was right. Yeah. I want to. My kids, I did invent one emoticon that I, I take. You're taking well, credit for it? Take credit for the big smile. The colon <laughs> big D. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Roberta, My kids that too. Um, I want to hear about how you got started in copywriting. But first, tell me about what was an inspiration for you growing up early on? Um, women who were firsts. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I it was an older book. It was really like was about 10 or 15 years old by the time I got it, uh, about women who were firsts. Uh, the first woman doctor, the first woman uh, uh, in the uh, sitting on the, the president's cabinet, uh, the first woman to do lots of things, mm -hmm. and first lawyer, first scientist. And I was, I was inspired by the stories of these women who – uh, were first in their fields, first women to do something important. And I thought to myself uh, that, you know, I wanted, to, I could, that I wanted to be one of these women in something. Um, and I wasn't sure what that was going to be, but I knew I wanted to do something uh, bigger than myself. And I didn't want to feel that I was being hampered because I was a girl. Um, so I think that inspired me first. Um, I, bo I was blessed with the writing talent, which showed itself early. Really? Um, my mother was a wonderful writer. Uh, I make a living as a copywriter, among other things. But you strip it all away, I'm just basically a, a writer. Uh, and my daughter, uh, my eldest girl, uh, is uh, a literary writer. Okay. So um, 
the sort of the third generation to express ourselves uh, verbally and in the written words, sort of exciting for me. But I didn't know what I was going to do with the writing. Uh, I thought I was going to go into journalism. I wasn't that attracted to fiction. I like the idea of writing about real things, real people, real events. Um, and then I thought I'd uh, take that to television. I was going to do that in a broadcast fashion. Um, long story short, though, I was in graduate school and I got a job as a junior copywriter for a publishing company. And I learned about uh, direct marketing, which they were doing very badly. Um, and I said, you know, I, I think I like this. Uh, I liked being able to write and then measure the response. I like the creative and the, the technical, um, being able to quantify my results, which comes out of my comedy, which we'll get back to in a second. Yes. I like knowing how I'm doing, and direct marketing is, is a hell of a way to make a living to know how you're doing. So um, I can't say that I came out of the womb thinking, oh, boy, I'm going to be you know, the world's <laughs> greatest copywriter. But um, I've had an opportunity to... Uh, make a good living and make an impact uh, on students and on clients and on employers, uh, as well as myself, to um, uh, to do important things. As I've said to people, I've helped build hospitals, I've helped educate doctors, I help engineers run their businesses better, um, uh, because I connect their need to the product, put it together, and yeah. put it in their hands. And I think there's a certain ability to that. Can you tell me about one of those? What was one uh, instance where you, uh, as an example, where you connected, you know, a hospital or doctor or engineer that would be good to talk about? Well, I've had a long career, so you know, I I, I think I just sort of do that uh, over the course. But actually, I think I'll talk about Adopt Shop as a way of doing that. Yeah, which um, uh, was my experiment in e-commerce in 1999. Nobody was doing it. I am a, a, a mom to two adopted children. Oh, okay. I've, I was going to ask about why Adopt Shop because right. I see copywriter, Adopt Shop. I didn't see the direct connection there. Um, my uh, two youngest children were adopted from oh, okay. Korea. And nice. since I love to make the personal professional, um, I, I just was thinking one day in the late 90s that, you know, uh, there's really no place for adoptive moms or parents or their friends to, to be able to easily find a, adoption gifts that celebrate ad adoption the way there is for pregnancy, traditional family building. Right. So in my, in my tremendous arrogance, I said, oh, I'll, I'm going to go do that. Um, so I taught myself e-commerce, cobbling together this, that, and the other thing to put together my first store. Um, the, the store that's online right now is probably the fifth iteration. It's really due for another. Um, but I discovered that having the store for me, it's all my writing. It's all, you know, my thought process. Yeah. But um, it's a happy place. People come to buy things there because, oh, I couldn't find this anywhere else. You have made my day. Right. It, you know, made it. I don't feel like somehow I'm a second class mom because I didn't have lots of things, uh, choices for myself. And so that was very gratifying uh, to me, not only as, as the creator of this store, hmm. um, but at knowing that there were people coming for like, you know, a happy reason, like a maternity shop. If you're going to right. buy a couple of maternity goods, you feel happy. It's a happy place. I created a little happy corner of the universe. Um, and it makes a little bit of money too. So yeah. that's all good too. Well, I'll have to tell my wife, she's a child psychologist and her dissertation was in adoption. So I'll have to tell her about Adopt Shop. Oh, please do. Yes. Uh, prior to Adopt Shop, I actually uh, opened, I did another website to teach myself just website design called adoptkorea.com, which is now out of date. But for its time, it was the foremost uh, information on adopting from Korea. And I, I did it as a way of journaling my own experience. When did so you start Adopt big, Shop? Like, I mean, this must be a really old, you know, fairly old site, right? Since 1999. Yeah. So, do you ever kick yourself and be like, "I should have bought every single word domain at the time," or so? Like, what do you what do you think about those those days? Well, you know, I actually bought and sold some some uh, URLs. You did. Yes, a couple. 
over time. Things I've sort of taken on. Somebody says, gee, I'd really like that. I said, okay, I'll sell it to you for whatever it is. Um, I suppose if I really wanted to um, to uh, k kick myself, it's because I, I that I didn't buy stuff like um, tomato um, or the simple stuff that everybody wants to to, uh, right. to purchase. But I think there is uh, there is quite a market for the buying and selling of uh, URLs, and it's quite fascinating. It's not just about the name; it's about how long it's been around. Right. And, it's quite a science uh, behind it. So, no, I don't kick myself too badly, but um, but I, I do think that there I kind of made a little bit more money than I did. So, when where does comedy fit in? Um, the comedy was again one of those accidental serendipity things. I uh, was in college, and some of my friends were putting together a party. They used to know I sang in the shower. At school, I went to Syracuse University. Okay, and so we're having parties with Roberta, and I have a terrible voice now. Too much, you know. Twenty years of yelling at my kids just killed my voice. <laughs> but um, so I came out and said, "No, I, I'm not comfortable singing." But then all of a sudden, I just started to, I don't know, just a bit uh, material just started to flow, and. The reaction was extraordinary from my friends who said they knew I was humorous, but to actually sort of do a set not knowing I was doing a set really was a one of those game changers for me. And I remember thinking, you know what, I could do this. I could do this. You know, there weren't a lot of women, and there were hardly any women. And there were a few like Phyllis Diller or Joan Rivers, um, yeah. Toadie Fields. There were just like a handful of women doing it. And they all... Um, would make fun of themselves. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I took my inspiration from George Carlin and David uh, Steinberg and Robert Klein, and I became, I started to do that. So on and off, I exper I used to work little clubs. Um, I, I think I made $30 one year. That was my <laughs> uh, But I enjoyed doing it. It was, it was fun, um, and, I was, and I was good. I wasn't great. But I was good. But I realized there was a certain part of my life where I just, I, you know, you have those revelations. And you say to yourself, I'm good at this, but I'll never be great. And I realized I wasn't going to be great because that I didn't need, uh, I didn't need the approval of strangers to make myself feel important. And I thought that most comics desperately need that. That's why they go into really? Yeah, I got. I would get. The, you know, I get the same pleasure making you laugh than than I would. You know, five hundred people in a room. It's it's ex all, I say it's almost exactly the same. Uh, and I said, you know what? Uh, I'll just be funny in the office. That, that's in my head. I just I'll just be funny in the office. So I decided to um, um, put put aside my stand up leanings and then. But incorporate what I learned from copywriting into what I do. The thread is I like getting a response, a mm -hmm. laugh, an order. Yeah. It's all good for me. But I also learned a lot about um, uh, copywriting from my experience with comedy, about timing and structure. This word is funny and this word isn't. Yeah. What do you? Um, what have you found about that? How to tell a story better. Yeah. It, so it all like dovetailed into my yeah. writing. What are some ways you – because I do find – it's interesting. Out of all the people I interview, copywriters, if I would guess someone's fun fact, there's been a number of copywriters who are ex-comedians. Yes. Right. Yeah. So what, what do you do the best way you structure a story? What do I do? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Um, I think it has to come from a genuine place. Uh, I'm I, not a joke teller. Uh, other comics can talk about other things, and I really am not a. I am not a comic. I am somebody who loves comedy, and you know, it's funny. But um, I think for me, it comes from a genuine place where I can make a personal connection that I can go my aha, and then translate it to somebody else's mm -hmm. aha. Um, that we all share more than we don't, and find the commonalities to to connect with them comedy is about connecting copywriting is about connecting mm -hmm. 
uh, and being able to have this two-way conversation and you're the only one talking or you're the only one writing, but you're still having a two-way conversation in your mind. Right. Um, so uh, that's where my, my stories or my, my copywriting will always come from. It's like, how can I connect to my prospect? How can I connect to my audience? My kids have heard me say for years and years when they complain about a teacher or this or that, I'll say, look, kids, you got to play the room. If this audience is filled with, you know, old blue haired ladies, they're not going to get hip hop humor. Just forget it. You have to talk to your audience where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I, Again, for copywriting, that's the same thing, to connect with your audience where they're at and lead them to where you want them to be. Yeah. So, Roberto, what's been a big turning point for you in your copywriter career? Uh, when I first opened my consultancy, which was um, in, in 1987. I had worked for a publishing company I mentioned before about five and a half years and I had uh, then worked for a direct marketing agency for another couple of years. So I basically about eight years in my adult life that I worked in direct marketing for, for other companies where I had one of those Roberta epiphanies. And I said, you know, and the technology was now, again, I'm a, I love technology. Um, Personal computers were just beginning to come to the fore. Fax machines made some interactivity easier. I said, you know what? I can do this on my own and I can do this at home. Because in my mind, I wanted to be, uh, I wasn't a, a, a parent at the time. I was sort of preparing my life to become a parent. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to be able to work from home Um but still have a, a really a legitimate business. So when I realized that everything I'd learned in copywriting, I could now take out of somebody else's office, put in my own office at home, have the technology as my backup. Um, that was a revelation. And I just said, okay, I'm just going to go for it. Mm -hmm. um, my first husband and I talked about it. I said, I'm going to need some money out of our savings to do this. I need two years. If I'm not making any real money after two years, I'll go back to a straight job and say thank you very much. Um, and 25 plus years later, um, it was it was a, it was a good gig. And now that consultancy is my part time work, and my full time work is with ACEC. So how did you? But that, that was a revelation to be able to say I can do this. It's a big step. It was. And a lot of folks was, oh, you're going to be working from home. It what didn't have the cachet that it it's had. not as yeah luxurious yeah. as it sounds. No, uh, my first company name was Montrose Green Hill and Player. Why? I wanted a very big name. <laughs> you sound like a law firm. <laughs> well, you know, if you really think about it, you've never met anybody by these last names. You've never met a Mr. Montrose or Ms. No. Montrose or. Green I'm in Hill. Chicago, and there's a street Montrose, so it does there's strike lots of, some. And I was actually. To be honest, I was inspired by a Montrose Road here in the Maryland area, uh -huh. um, and I realized it was uh, an English variant on the name Rosenberg. Really? Montrose, Rose Mountain, huh. Berg. And I, and I started to do this in my head. All right, Rosenberg, Montrose. What could, Greenberg was my mother's middle name. Uh, then I could make that Green Hill. And my uh, my husband at the time, his last name was Chess, C H E S S. And I said, "Why can't I do with Chess?" I said, "Well, you're what? Are you, you're a player." So it became Montrose Green Hill and Player. Nice. Direct marketing. Uh, and the minute that it was had more cachet to have your work from home, it became MGP Direct because <laughs> it was a lot. Of, it was a very big name, very small company. How did you get your first big client? Um, because now personal, you're at home and now you need clients. Personal, personal contacts. Um, I was active in the Direct Marketing Association of Washington. I had spent uh, seminal years in medical publishing in the first years of my career, um, and then at the agency that I went to. All of those connections 
have, can, in fact, continue to show returns after all these years of, um, I oh, Roberta, I just moved somewhere to a new company. I'd like you to come on board. I'd like to talk with you. Um, so the business, for the most part, came to me without a lot of work. I did feel the shift when that online experience exploded in the, in the mid-2000s. Um, and that's when I became involved with Copyblogger and became a more of an online marketing presence. Mm -hmm. I realized if I was going to expand my uh, marketplace, I had to do it online. So that's why I looked for opportunities to sort of show my wares. Mm -hmm. Copy Blogger was a tremendous opportunity. Teaching for these other organizations uh, certainly was another way. Yeah. So, Robert, at the time, you're working for other companies. You strike on your own. How do you decide what to charge people? Uh, I would talk to other writers, get a sense of what they were doing. Uh, one of the things uh, I've always liked about the copywriting community, and I don't know if this is true for the other business creatives. My sense is it's not. But I have found that in the, among copywriters, we are extremely collegial. We, you know, I can't do this, Bill. Can I send this over to you? Would you look at this copy for Great me? Very collaborative, sure. yeah. Um, so we're very collegial with each other, not terribly competitive. So I was able to talk to lots of my peers to say, look, I'm thinking about going I think there's up. a friendly competitiveness, like I want to beat your control competitiveness or something like that. You know, if, if it is, I don't feel it with other writers. It's sort of like we just – there's lots of business for us and – Right. It's abundance mentality. Yeah, there's an abundance mentality. I'll help you. You'll help me. I'll answer your question. You'll answer mine. So really, it was my peers who were very helpful in, in sharing their information and their experience with me, as now I pay it forward and do it with other people. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a sense of the, you know, my market, which was the Washington, Baltimore area, working primarily in B2B, um, what, the, what people were charging and getting, and maybe I could get that too. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some of the successful campaigns and why they were so effective? Um, I can tell you that for my current employer, uh, rather than go into the past, I can yeah. talk about currency. Um, for my current employer, they had sort of a, a very lackluster marketing uh, approach. Uh, it was old fashioned, it wasn't taking advantages of the technology, um, and uh, a little bit lazy. I think would be fair. So when I came on board, I was able to quickly ascertain that there were areas that I could make big impact because that's what I love to do. I like mm -hmm. to make a big impact. Um, there were areas that I could make a big impact on, not only, you know, crispy sharpening up the messaging, but improving the, uh, the scheduling and the timing and the look and feel of our promotions and better branding and, um, really sort of across the board, sort of bringing everything up to a certain um, level of quality that, that I was used to working at. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy that everyone's very accommodating to say, okay, we're going to just let you just do, do it. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's been extraordinarily successful for them. What were some of the things that you changed that really worked? Um, I uh, Best practices in email marketing certainly comes to mind. Um, which uh, recognizes that, uh, you know, what's the best way for uh, to approach your prospect, timing, length of the email, where you send them next, um, how to structure an email properly, um, test your headlines, uh, long copy versus short copy. There was a lot of testing uh, involved uh, in marketing to um, ACEC members. Um, I think my biggest revelation, I always come back to this human to human kind of thing, is that uh, I am not an engineer. Uh, this was one more industry I was getting to know. Uh, that's the nice thing about B2B is you're always learning new industries. Uh, so I'm not an engineer, but I realized that um, ACEC was all about engineering businesses. Yeah. So what do they do exactly to give people uh, an idea? 
that they are the voice. ACEC is the voice of the American engineering industry. Mm -hmm. They're a trade association. They they are very active in you know making sure that you know like our infrastructure is uh, attended to. Uh, that's of great interest to our members. But um, what I was going to what the revelation that I had was is that I'm talking to business owners. I don't have to know engineering. I have to know what a business owner cares about. And I know that because I've run one. I've run a mm. couple of businesses. So I know what keeps somebody up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Which I is? Engineer to know that. Which is what? Uh, how to get new business, keep the business, get the old business back, how to meet your payroll, how to deal with your staff, how to improve your technology, um, uh, what to do when you decide to retire. These are the same questions. It doesn't matter what your business is. Yeah. I think trade associations are classic of, of putting out articles or, um, you know, letters that, about articles that no one cares about. Well, I don't address those things. Um, but, I mean, you do because of what you're saying. Divisions to, yeah. to handle those matters. But I would say that what people, what people were surprised at when I came on board is that I, I brought this, well, wait a minute, they're just business owners. We, I, I don't know, have to know anything about engineering to know what they care about. That was a light bulb moment. So another one of those human to human things. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be up at two o'clock in the morning worrying about something. Yeah. I know what they worry about. Maybe they're worrying about big stuff like bridges falling down. Probably not. That would be really big. Right. But so I, I can't address that, but I can address the other aspects of their their work in a genuine person to person way. So their emails before I came on board, we do a lot of email marketing, read very third person passive, you know, but like they think B2B marketing is, it's boring, it's, you know. I came on board and started to address these folks by their name. I added personalization. This is not rocket science, by the way, Jeremy. This is, you know, just stuff. But for them, it was a big leap. Mm -hmm. So to say, Bill, have you heard about this? I even put in little little icons into the subject heads. Um, the ones you invented. It's not just for no reason at all. But where it made sense to do so, to warm up the emails, get them noticed more frequently, get them acted upon. Um, if there's a paradigm shift, there's another shift going on right now, is that, uh, and I have my phone here, so I like to illustrate, more than 60% of us are now looking at our email first here. Right. Not on the desktop. Yeah. They're looking at it here or on a tablet. So this is, I talked about context. Yeah. This is how I know people are looking at my mail. They're just spinning, going through. I got maybe one second now. We used to have like three. I have one second to get them to stop. So what do you say, do? What do you do to get them to stop? Huh? What kind of email subjects uh, have worked? Uh, personalization helps. Mm -hmm. um, the little icons, when used judiciously, help. Uh, and and if there's and I, I talk about this in other courses that I've, I've taught. Front load what's important. You have about five words. Don't, don't, no warm up copy in there. Just front load what's important. So there's, I do some bracketing sometimes to say webinar. I want them to know exactly what I'm talking about. Webinar. Hey, Bill. <laughs> Something. Um, because I am fighting that, that, that finger that's just moving like this. Right. On the train. You have one <laughs> on second. Plane, Less than a second. One second. Yeah. I want to make sure that they go, oh, I want to read that later. They may or may not act on it now. I just want them to star it. Right. And when they get to the office or they have a little bit more time, then to go back to the email. Now, I thought that's how it worked. I've actually read this research that says that's exactly how it works. Now, more and more of us, more of us are going to be doing it this way. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to play to the small screen. Yeah. Not the big screen that I'm talking to you on, which right. is about 24 inches yes. um, here. So that's a big shift, and that is going to continue to 
deeply affect how we uh, how we market. You know, big data is going to be a big big uh, chunk of our expression and being micro marketers even more you're slicing and dicing our databases and and more behavioral and what are people doing and uh, trigger marketing and, and there's a lot of great interesting stuff happening right now that uh, you know I'm, I'm putting starting to touch upon where I'm at now with my with ACEC as well as some uh, private clients so what were some of the campaigns you know, oftentimes we learn a lot from what didn't work that we thought would. What were some campaigns in the past that you saw didn't work and the specifics of why you realized it, it actually didn't? Um, I think more times than not, promotions haven't worked when I've let the client um, have their head. Um, you know, ultimately, as as a as a consultant, you know, I say this is my best advice, but it's your done. Right. You know, I get paid no matter what, but I respect what you know the investment in me. If I don't tell you this, I won't be doing my job. Right. But now, you know, you're going to have to take that take that forth. I mean, sometimes my instincts have been a little bit off, or they've been a little bit um, uh, premature. But I will tell you about one failure. It wasn't a failure on the, on the face of it. Years ago, I was working for a newsletter publisher. They were looking to promote subscriptions. And I said, do you have anything that we can use as a premium to encourage a subscription? They said, yeah, we got this two-year-old book. Uh, we got it, you know, hundreds of copies. You can use that. I said, okay. I wrote their promotion. They got something like a 12% response to the, to, the, to the offer. I was like, it's amazing. But the problem was I, I sold the premium so well that people subscribed to get the premium and then immediately unsubscribed. Huh. So, so it was like a monthly subscription and then they'd get it and they'd just cancel. Right, because they wanted the premium. This two-year-old book that they couldn't get rid of previously. So they came back to me very upset that... I oversold the premium and I didn't sell the subscription hard enough. And I said, well, I really didn't know what to do with that. Yeah, so what do you do? Um, just start selling the premium as its own product or something? Or? No, we, we just took that premium out and we tried to come up with uh, other variations and it was never as successful. Isn't that sort of what you want? You want someone almost getting it because of the premium, like the premium's that strong? Right, but the problem is the premium was so strong that it looked, uh, it made the, 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 the subscription product too weak. Hmm. And what I didn't realize at the time is that this, that, that, was, that newsletter is, was basically on its last legs anyway. So they were looking to sort of save it. Um, if there's another lesson that I, that can be learned here is don't fall in love with your stuff. Um, if you're running a business, you have to be sort of hard-hearted about it. And um, I think about uh, film directors who talk about um, their film and, and scenes that they cut, that they loved. They love these little scenes all by themselves. Right. But it, it, uh, it didn't help move the story along or it confused the audience. So they had to excise it from the film, yeah. these sweet little moments that they loved. Yeah. They loved. But for the greater good, for, for the good of the movie, they had to take it out and let it go. I think uh, not falling in love with your promotions and not falling in love with your products and services, uh, let them do their job. If they can't do their job, grieve it a little bit, and then excise it from your program um, is, is an important lesson for, for us all. So what was the time, Roberta, where you had this story in your copy that you loved and you ended up having to cut it out? I wrote a promotion. This, is, I, I, this one never saw the light of day. Um, I wrote a promotion for um, a psychologist who had a memory program, memory enhancement program which was looked really good. I mean, I was very impressed by it. And at the time, the audience was, uh, you know, obviously much older. 
I would say, World War II Korea generation that we were promoting to. So I tried, you know, again, you want to make that, that connection, speak in the language of your audience. That's, oh, that's another website thing, too, in your landing page. Talk in the, in, in the language of your audience, not in technical jargon. There's always a disconnect. I'm looking for a plumber. I'm not looking for an, an sanitation engineer. Right. I'm a plumber. Um, so I wrote this copy, and uh, the intro to it was, you know, just because you're getting older, you occasionally misplace the car keys, something like that. Do you think you're, you know, you're losing it or something like that? And I wrote in the big letters. My mom needs that. No, I'm just... I wrote baloney. And not like, I didn't spell it like Bologna. I wrote baloney. And finished the rest of the copy. This was, you know, Jeremy, this was a kick-ass promotion. I loved writing it. I, it was, I showed it to some of my, my copywriting compadres. They said, dead on, perfect. Give it to the client. Submit it to the client for his review. I'm on uh, Skype. He loathed it. Really? He loathed it. He said, I would never say baloney. I would never do any of those things. I said, this isn't about you. This is about them. This is about speaking to them in their Wait, life. They're a psychologist? Shouldn't they know this? You would think. So, I mean, I, he paid me for the job. He had to pay me for the job. I don't, I don't do kill, fee, kill fees. But uh, it never saw the light of day. But I would use it as part of my portfolio. <laughs> because it's good. I loved this promotion. Um, the flip on that is uh, when I was working for the agency, I uh, had an opportunity to... Uh, to uh, help them with some membership acquisition for a um, educational association. And um, I was going through the files and I saw somebody referencing the old um, Rodney Dangerfield line, I get no respect, right. in a completely different piece. And I was working on this educational piece. I said, you know, educators, respect, that, re that, that resonated for me. So I rewrote the intro and something like, you know, being a teacher is whatever it is, but it makes you feel like Rodney Dangerfield and you don't get no respect. And the rest of the promotion was exactly the same. I just changed the intro. Um, sent it out. Completely gangbuster response. Just, just, if we were swimming in response that they had never had before. Um, so it taught me as a copywriter that everything happens in that first couple of lines where you're establishing what, you know, you're making that connection and you've got to make it early and you've got to make it hard and you've got to make it obvious. They've got to feel it in the gut. And if they do, not that the rest of it is easy, but if you don't make the connection at the beginning, it's just not going to happen anywhere. Mm hmm yeah. So, you know, that was the flip. The same sort of looking to make the connection. I had the my baloney piece, as I like to call it. Never saw the light of day. But this other piece showed me, because I was still fairly early in my career, showed me the possibilities of that big open and that big connection that you make. Yeah. I mean, Roberta, you also have a lot of students you teach. What are some of the big mistakes that you see them making? Um... They want to yell in their copy. They think marketing copywriting is a lot of yelling. Um, you know, lots of over-the-top language, lots of hyperbole. Uh, you know, they think that the writing is sort of like watching a 30-minute infomercial where you're hammering people. Now, there is a place for that. For the work that I do, again, primarily business to business, mm -hmm. you can't do that tone at all. And I don't really think it's the most effective in business to consumer either. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to, you know, try to bring all that it, that bad habits. What would be an example of that yeah. of that yelling? Um, when I have them, let's say, write something about alternative health, which is a favorite niche for in business to consumer, they'll immediately want to start sort of 
hammering away at, you know, your doctor is, doesn't have your best interests at heart, and there's big pharma, and there's this, and there's, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So let's just bring the noise level down. Why, would, why do you want somebody to take something all natural? Forget about the big pharma just for a minute. You know, let's talk about how people really use this stuff and, and how you can make the connection to, you know, you go to the doctor, but somehow it's not enough. You take the medicine, it's still not making you feel better. And, and do it that way. Bring the noise level down, bring the genuine emotion up, the genuine need to want to help and almost consult with your prospect. Um, I think that consultative nature, uh, that's that's my style, obviously, and everybody has their own style. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very good at the big shout. I just don't think it, um, I just don't think it's my, it's not my go-to, but it tends to be a lot of novices go-to because that's what they see more mm -hmm. than. Mm -hmm. What have been some big challenges in the journey? Uh, in what respect in, in the journey? The Professional. Copyright? No, or personal relating to professional because um, they do intertwine when you're working from home I'm sure true remember I mean I, I do the work from home but I now work in an office yeah. too yeah. so I can see the, the do the contrast and compare uh, if you're working at home the biggest challenge is um, respecting your your time because it's very easy to go I'll work a couple hours go do something come back your day never ends yeah you know, when I worked from home, primarily, people would say they had a snow day. I'd say, I'd love a snow day. What's a snow day? A snow day is a day at the work job for you, right? Right. I broke my ankle. I still had to work. That's when my, my husband put together our first Wi-Fi because I couldn't get downstairs to my desk. So I had to work at the dining room table. Um, so I, I think that uh, the, uh, the ability to say, I work normal hours, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. eight to six, seven to five, whatever, and then have everybody respect it. Clients would call me at all hours, you know, or email me or text me. Why aren't you? You know, can I talk to you? No, it's call me in the morning. It's my time off. I'm, I want to be with my family now. So I think that's the tough thing for the work at home. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, the other biggest challenge for me, and this is sort of my just my personal interest, is that there's so much excite, exciting things going on in marketing technology that I wish I had just more time in the day to explore these things and to really make the technology uh, do, do more of the heavy lifting. That's what I think technology should do. I think it should do more of the heavy lifting so that we can do really fun, interesting, innovative, uh, and effective ways to connect with our customers. Mm -hmm. I would think a challenge too, I know you mentioned, I want you to talk a little bit about work-life balance. And you know, you have three kids. Yes, I do. One is, one is on her own though. So I got two teenagers at home. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, I, I think that, um, and we, before we started recording, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, uh, my uh, all three of my children are millennials, and um, I, I and I work with millennials, and I love to to listen to them talk about work life balance, or you know, well, you know, it's five o'clock. I'm going to drop my pencil now, and just because that's how it is. Um, although the although they want to work hard. They don't want to work too hard because that might impede their their personal life stuff. And, you know, all I can say is that, you know, being able to prioritize what's important in your life is going to impact that work-life balance thing. I decided long ago that taking cleaning my house just wasn't a huge priority. <laughs> um, you can't do everything all at the same time and do them equally well. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to build a business, it's just going to take some time and it's going to take time away from your, your, your play time and your, you know, unfortunately may even take some time away from your family. I think for women, even more so than men, although it is 2014, um, I think that impacts us more. 
um, to be able to to balance a family and work. And if you're an entrepreneur or you're running a, managing a business or have a high level job, it's just very hard to do it all really, really well. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to um, prioritize better, realize there are some things we're just going to have to let go. Uh, folding laundry can, can be at the top of that list as well. And that's what dryers are for with a wet washcloth. They come out just, just fine. Um, but um, that uh, there are times when it's time to turn it off too. Yeah. And it's okay to take, you know, a day to say, today I do nothing. Today I read a book. Today I go play with my friends or my family or those kinds of things. But it's always a struggle and it's always rebalanced. Yes. Like Some, your portfolio, you should be rebalancing. Yes. Both. Sometimes it's easier said than done because you know in the back of your mind you should be probably – you have this list of things you need to do. I always have a list constantly ticking yes. uh, in the back of my mind, as as I think you know many of us do who are, are balancing lots of things um, right now. But to build a business, if that's what somebody's looking to do, you can't do it in a four day work week. Mm -hmm. You can't do it working forty hours and dropping your pencil at five o'clock. Right. It's just not how it happens, yeah. which can be so much more productive today because the technology allows it. When I started in this business a long time ago, it would take me three months to get one project done. I'd have to mail purchase orders. I'd have to, this sounds like old timey, like, you know, when fire was invented. <laughs> but, you know, I'd have to mail purchase orders. I'd have to wait for a mailing list. Three months. That's what it took. Now I can throw a promotion together, a landing page, write some copy in about twelve minutes. Right. And I'm but I'm expected to do it in twelve minutes. Yeah. So everything is very sped up too. So yes, yeah. we're we're much more productive, but we're sort of all ADD and very like this all the time. So sometimes it's good to turn off the electronics and go take a walk in the woods. Mm-hmm. But I, you've had a you know successful career. What's been a painful moment? A low point. Uh, when I saw the shift coming from being a print, from direct mail, mostly a print-based marketing technology, to the online technology, um, I knew that I, my, me personally, this is, and I'm being, you know, just sort of honest, um, that I was going to take a hit because that was a really good income stream for me. I also knew that my printer vendors were, were increasingly taking hits because they would call and say, Roberta, do you have anything? And the answer is no, I don't. I'm doing it all online. I'm doing, or I'm doing more of it online. Mm -hmm. Or I'm, I'm producing it and making them print it off in a PDF as opposed to printing it for them. Mm -hmm. So um, that was feeling that shift from the direct mail-centric focus of my work to direct on or digital marketing focus um, was a big change for me in how I thought about my business. It also was a hit to me in the revenue stream um, that I had to, I was anticipating it, I knew it was coming, so I could uh, work with that. But nonetheless, it was, um, that was a tough one. Yeah. And that was, that was the big change for me as, as a small agency at the time, as it was for many of my uh, my colleagues who had small agencies. Yeah, and especially the industry probably has to catch up uh, as well at the time, so it makes it. I mean, there's more still difficult. print. We still do some print, but we don't do print the way we used to. We mm -hmm. just don't. What about a proud moment? What's been one of the proudest accomplishments? Uh, I was the um, president of the Women's Direct Response Group in Washington. We had a couple of chapters around the country. Um, and I came on board as president. It was very small. We do these little brown bag lunches, you know, kind of thing. And um, I had gone to the New York chapter uh, event, big event, where they, it was big and glossy and very, and I said, well, I can't be deep. So I came back to Washington and uh, to our chapter, and I said, you know, I want to make this happen. I want to do something big like this. And everybody told me I couldn't make it happen. And I said, well, that's just neat for me. Anytime 
And somebody says, you can't do that. I said, of course I can. And then I have to go figure it out because I've committed myself. So um, I, I took us from a very small presence, you know, not a lot of money in the bank, just little brown baggy kind of thing, to uh, within a year we had a big event, put a ton of money in our bank account, big glossy event in Washington. It was exciting. It was super successful. And we were able to parlay that for, for a few years before we had to close the group simply because uh, the purpose of our group no longer applied to where the industry was and where women were in the industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of women, a ton of women now in the direct marketing business. So um, we didn't quite need that separate presence any longer. But when I think back on my career, that was really a proud moment for like at our, our event. And I stood in front of hundreds of people, the members, their friends and, and vendors and, and stuff and said, we did it. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that, that was a really good moment. Remember, you teach a lot of students. Who are some of your mentors and some of the best advice they've given you? Um, I'm all self-taught. Uh, I, you know, when I started as a junior copywriter, even my boss, who was critiquing my copy, she came from the mainstream advertising world, not not direct marketing. So I had to like find books. Yeah. So what are your favorites? Um, these would be sort of old. Some of them are old, not terribly old. Uh, Bob Stone. <laughs> was one of my the books that I read. He was a pioneer in direct marketing. Um, Joan Throckmorton was another. Eugene Schwartz uh, wrote some wonderful books that are still very much in demand. Um, being a member of the Direct Marketing Association of Washington, I was able to attend events and workshops. Uh, and then I would talk to people and how do you do that. Uh, and I did spend a lot of time in, and uh, the publishing company's money experimenting um, with their uh, with their good graces I could say I would I read about this can I go try that and they more times than not they'd say okay so um, I would say that uh, I've, I've learned from uh, learned from books from I stand on the shoulders of everybody else uh, and I was able to incorporate that I had um, bosses and companies that were supportive of my exploring direct marketing uh, on their dime, knowing that they they were going to get a return. Not that I was just, you know, a mad scientist back there just doing stuff for no reason. Right. Um, but the idea was to, to move everything forward, to increase sales, increase revenues, increase numbers of books sold or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So um, I, w I wouldn't say that I, I've had one mentor or or sort of core mentors, but I I have had lots of very supportive people who said, "Go for it." Yeah, I have one last question, but I really appreciate your time. But first, tell people what you're working on now. What's exciting? Where can they find you online? Where should they check out? Um, well, you can find me on Twitter uh, at uh, copywriter Maven because I couldn't get the ing in there, so I'm copywriter Maven. On Twitter, they can check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, my the last uh, part of my URL is Roberta Rosenberg Maven. Um, I did write a blog called the Copywriting uh, Maven. Uh, it is uh, woefully out of date. Don't go there because I still haven't cleaned it up, and Google will tell you it's a malware site. So don't do that. I haven't had time to go back and, and clean that kind of thing up. Um, so, but you can find me at, at uh, on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, if you just put Roberta Rosenberg marketing into Google, you'll find me easily as well. Uh, what am I working on that's exciting? Um, I'm getting deep into marketing automation now. I, okay. I talked a little bit about that before. Mm -hmm. And I'm just about ready to, to do it in a big way for ACEC. Okay. And really start um, pushing the needle forward in uh, trigger marketing uh, in a way that they've never experienced before. So that's getting me sort of jazzed. Nice. So my last question is, obviously, you've spewed out a lot of knowledge, a lot of tips. What's one last piece of advice that someone should start doing right now to improving their copy or, or their sales in general from their landing page? Speak in your customer's language. Don't speak in, in company jargon. I, I talked about you know, when you need a plumber, you're not looking for a, a, you know, 
a sanitation engineer mm-hmm. you need. Uh, in the book business, we tend to talk about books as titles. But if I'm, if I'm promoting a book, I never use the word title because it means something different to our audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say write in the language of your customer. I would say meet them where they are, be where they are, and maybe you could be a little bit ahead of where they are and be kind and generous about bringing them along to where you want to be, where you want to have them. Yeah. Uh, and respect your audience always. Yeah. I said, I said that was my last question, but I lied. I have one more question okay. because the Jewish father in six words you wrote. Yes. What, what is the, can you tell me? What is the six? What yeah. Is the, what is the story? Um, the story, and it's all true. Let's just give me a second. I have to remember it. Um, I just had to do, I had counted out okay. six. It is clean linen handkerchiefs comfort me still. I had to ask that. I appreciate you sharing. That was my dad. Yes. Roberta, thank you so much for your time. It's been thank very you. valuable. So very I hope fun. everybody gets to learn something. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Have a good one.